Someone like Walt Disney, they either make him out to be this amazing genius, this god, this idol who could have never done wrong. They make him, or they make him out to be a complete dragon. And he was just a person. I'm sure he, he was, was. He was a little was, bit of both. He was a yeah. dude. This is Rodrigo Huerta, and here we are with another episode of Shot Talk. I have today the esteemed Michael Rocco. Uh, Michael and I go back a little bit, and yeah. he was gracious enough to come by and talk to us. So, so Michael pulled away all the way from Burbank, all the way, all the three, four miles on the other side of the hill. <laughs> That's right. It's, it was, it's it was three a, miles straight, about ten miles. It was a long journey. Guess, you you yeah. packed plenty of rations and food and water, and, and you made it. Pack mules outside. I'm just happy you're alive, dude. At Thank this you. point. Um, so, Michael, a little bit of background. Uh, you came out here, uh, obviously, looking for animation work. You got into, I think your first official gig was at... Shadow Machine. Shadow right down Machine. the road here. Right. And then from there, you got into Bugs. Bugs. Uh, yeah. Is that the name of the show? Well, it was Wabbit. Originally. Wabbit. That's what it was. I knew it was a single word. Well, it was called Bugs in other countries, because uh -huh. Wabbit couldn't be translated. Sure. Into other languages. Right. So they just called it What does bugs. Elmer Fudd sound like in, uh, with, I, with the speech impediment in, in I Spanish? I have no <laughs> idea. I'd love to know. So then you did that for a couple of years, and you are still at Warner I'm Brothers. I'm still at Warner Brothers, but I'm working on something else that I can't okay, talk about. Okay, that we yet. cannot talk about. Yeah. But soon the world will know. Soon, hopefully soon. We'll, hopefully soon. How, how long from now do you think it'll be public information? Um, anywhere between one month to... Three years. I have no idea. <laughs> okay, so you know, whenever, whenever it happens. Anything within that 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 window. Now, one of the things that I wanted to talk to you about because I know uh, when I sort of got the animation bug back when I was in college, a, a huge source of inspiration for me was the golden era. I think for a lot of animators was the golden era of animation back in the 30s and 40s and a little bit into the 50s when we had. You know, the Warner Brothers uh, uh, and, and Disney, of course, they were doing their features as well as their shorts. And it felt like this sort of time of exploration and innovation because at that point, animation was a wild, wild west. There wasn't any sort of, uh, you know, formalities in terms of how to do it. So it felt like everybody was, it was like a gold rush, right, of talent sort of figuring out how things worked. So I know, and, and your work feels very, very inspired from that era. And, and, uh, so that's one of the reasons that uh, I thought we should touch on that. Yeah. And one of the things that um, I thought was, which again, we, we is, this feels like a reoccurring theme that keeps coming up anytime I talk to artists, is that sort of, uh, we're living in an era right now where uh, things sometimes tend to be a little bit overproduced, where everybody, everybody wants success right off the bat, everybody wants to see immediate numbers. And uh, back in, in those uh, glory days, animation was sort of, and correct me if I'm wrong, it felt like it was sort of cast aside as sort of uh, this experimental child. At least it was on the Warner lot, To right? some extent. I mean, like, in the case of, say, you know, Disney set the bar, so everyone was trying to make d either Disney-type shorts, or, and then there was a very small group of people who were like, well, let's do something that Disney wouldn't do. Mm -hmm. So they do something that was more comedic, more self-referential. Like, Disney wanted people to think that the characters that they were creating were alive, right. to the point where they wouldn't get screen credit like actors wouldn't get screen credit, and then like Disney would pretty much own their lives wow. to a certain point. Wow! So you you went to see Donald Duck and nothing but Donald Duck. Well, not no. It's more so that like, well, yeah. I mean, if you would go see something like Snow White, the woman who played Snow White, right? She she was auditioned. She was young. I think she was eighteen when she did Snow White, and then she had a really you know, you would think her future would be. You know, nowadays, if someone does a big film, right. they would blow up and they would be like, oh my God, they're going to be in so many movies. They're going to get, they'll be on the radio. They're going to get, they're going to, I don't know, if she's a singer, they'll, they'll, she'll be singing albums and stuff like that. Right, right. No. Disney pretty much felt like he, it's one of the few things that people don't usually talk about in terms of Disney. Disney wanted people to think that like characters like the Seven Dwarves and, and Pinocchio and some of those characters were real. Living, breathing. Re living, breathing. Because they were Characters, wanted, yeah. You don't want to be, he would not, rem he he really didn't want people to th know that these characters were just drawn. I would have loved to have seen Andy Serkis alive in that era and seeing how he would have dealt with this sort of philosophy of, of uh, well, I don't know, owning, you know, yeah, owning everything. Because yeah, you know, obviously he made a big stink about like 
you know, being recognized for his work and all his mocap stuff. So that's, yeah. that's interesting. But, it's, but like, imagine being the voice of a popular Disney character and not being able to say that you are that Disney character. Well, so contractually, they weren't allowed to even I guess under certain, advertise I guess themselves. whatever contract that, like, her, her name was Adriana, Adriana Casalotti, I think her name was. She, Disney felt like she, he owned, his company owned that voice now. Wow. So, and which was just her voice, wow. her singing yeah. voice, natural singing voice. So she would do, when the movie came out, she would do like radio spots where she would play Snow White, mm -hmm. but she wouldn't be known as the woman who plays Snow White, you know. So it wasn't until the 1970s, like the 60s or 70s, where people were like, oh wait, you're the voice of Snow White, and I, you can talk about it now? Yes, I technically can. But she had no career after Jeez that. Jeez Louise. She had no, like, who, do you know who the You know voice, funny, because- like, do you know the voices of any of the dwarves? Right, and absolutely, no I don't, right. Or any of the characters in Pinocchio? Right. But part of me thinks like, I, I also maybe wouldn't know if you did mention a name, because, you know, you know I only right. know Clark Gable and, and uh, a couple other people yeah. from that era. Well, they had mostly it, radio people, was people who were famous for being on the radio, they were character actors, or they would, like, there was like in Snow, in Snow White, they hired people who had very specific quirks. It's weird how it, it feels like now they've overcorrected, where, You'll go to see a Blue Sky film or, or a DreamWorks movie, and you see in big aerial font just Seth Rogen, like is the first thing that slaps you in the face. And I feel there's got to be a middle ground there, where, where I feel in the '90s, I guess with Disney films, that was a pretty good place because they had they had big talent. Like, well, the big one in the '90s was was Robin Williams. And right, Robin you go, Williams. You go right. see the genie, and it's just Robin Williams as a character, rather than being. And then earlier on, I guess to some extent, they had Baloo in the Jungle Book, uh -huh. which is just Phil Harris. Kind of just being himself, but he was this character Baloo. Right. Whereas if you look at you know most of the Disney characters, they're playing a character, and there's no real connection. Like, oh, that's obviously so and so playing this character. Right. Like now you go see like a like a Ice Age movie, and you'll see Ray Romano is Manny, the, right. the mammoth, and it's him doing his Ray Romano bit, or it's you know John Leguizamo. They'll and tell you like here's the actor playing. Like I don't think. Like when you see like Scarlett Johansson as the voice of something, most people I don't think they're going to go see specifically an animated movie because Scarlett Johansson's a voice of a that's, character. In that's that's what I think marketers think people are going to do, uh, and I think I, get, I think it's guys like us who who just love animation can't fathom why anybody would see a movie for that reason. Yeah, like, but maybe it does happen. It probably does happen to a lot of people. Yeah. Um, sorry, just to, just to bring us back to to uh, uh, the nineteen thirties forties. Um, I know, uh, I've read a little bit about how uh, termite terrace used to work and, and, and sort of like uh, the, because what always interests me is, is sort of like the conditions that made amazing stuff, so, stuff that, that everybody remembers forever. And I remember reading about how it felt like at Warner Brothers at least, you kind of had a, a little shack in the, in the middle of the studio and they threw in a bunch of you know, crazy, funny people and gave them a bunch of uh, uh, drawing tables and kind of for the most part, were hands off with what they were doing. Like the, the producer, what's his name? Uh, Leon Schlesinger. Leon Schlesinger. He would literally say during dailies, "Roll the crap." Like he he was just a bean counter and didn't understand why people were laughing at this stuff. But he never tried to get creative about it, as far as I understand. Well, like I mean, he, like yeah, I mean, if he has to sell, I mean, because a creative producer is kind of regular now. You go into at least in my experience, we'd go into dailies, and there were. There was, the, there was the director, and then you had four other producers uh, sitting in the same row as he was, and they all had to chime in with creative notes and ideas. Sadly, oftentimes they, were really, they weren't the best ideas, but I, can't, I don't think that happened back then, at least not in that specific situation. You know? Well, unless someone has a specific vision, which I know that like Leon Schlesinger didn't have an artistic vision like Walt Disney did. Disney right. was a natural And there you go, talent. that's the other side of the coin, is Disney was very specific, and he was obviously yeah. producing everything. Right, so. and Disney wanted to be like a director, not specifically an animation director. He wanted to just make movies and make people laugh or cry or whatever. He wanted to be a filmmaker. He loved things like, he loved Charlie Chaplin, so he wanted to make his own mark on the mm -hmm. world. And it just so happened to be an animation that he had unlimited, unlimited possibilities of what he can do in terms of fantasy and stuff like that. But he wanted people to feel like those movies were real, those characters were real, and he had a very he was very creatively involved in almost everything, up to a certain point. Whereas at the at Warner Brothers, they were like, "Well, we have to make stuff to put in front of these movies, right? Like cartoons, just like people would have to make newsreels and short subjects, like Three Stooges films, to put in front of, you know." Of the I mean, mail. Disney's one of those special situations where he, as much as he was. Uh, 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 you know, a big producer type. He 
made some really, really calculated yet incredibly uh, fruitful uh, decisions with how he did things. And, right. And I well, if feel, he believed in something, then he would. He wouldn't want to if he didn't completely believe in an idea. He wouldn't go through with it. Right. If, but if he he would sh strive really hard to make that thing a reality if he really believed in it, even if it meant nearly going bankrupt dozens of times, which right. he almost And that's, I hear stories about Disney where he, he completely throws himself in, almost, almost like a lot of filmmakers who, you hear their stories like Sylvester Stallone, how he, he was living, uh, you know, uh, he was gonna sell his dog just to, get, just to get the first Rocky done, just because he believed in it that yeah. much. And he went to those lengths to make stuff happen. And then right. I think it was Snow White when everybody thought he was fucking out of his mind for making a, yeah. a 90 the minute cartoon. Yeah, the will hurt your eyes. Right. Would, people were like, oh, no one's going to sit and watch a cartoon for more than, I mean, seven or eight minutes at a time. The right. colors would be too bright. And now we've got how many 90-minute cartoons coming out this year? You know, it's, well, it's just, I lost I've count. lost track. Yeah, yeah. exactly. So it's There crazy. was times where it was in the, do like, almost two dozen major right. releases. <laughs> now, I don't know. I haven't really keep, kept track of that kind of right. stuff. Right. Yeah, but now, so, that, yeah, that's interesting. Because um, another thing, too, that, that I think, I don't know how involved Disney was with, the short form stuff, because I, I always, when I think of Disney shorts from that era, I think amazing animation, but a little bit boring for my taste. And then I think of Warner Brother uh, shorts. Obviously, those those are the ones that they, people still yeah. wear. Well, people wear don't Bugs know Bunny the shirts these days, so. right? But like people don't remember Disney Disney short directors. They don't remember Disney film directors because people just think, oh, Walt Disney made all these movies. His name was in the forefront, but like right. there was a whole bunch of directors on these things. But they're all making a a Disney product. But everybody remembers. Tex Avery, Chuck Jones, Bob Clampett. Tex, like these yeah. are all very specific people that that it feels like they had more of an identity, right? For what well, yeah, they were well, doing. they were let each each had their own kind of voice, and so like you look at all those cartoons, they had different ways of drawing bugs, they had different ways of drawing Daffy, they had different ways, uh, different beliefs in terms of timing, what they where they could push things or exaggerate things, where they could pull back. Do you have a, a director from the Termite Terrace days? That by the way, I keep saying Termite Terrace for people who don't know. That was what they would. That was like they, a colloquial term that they would call their own because it was like a crappy shack. It was a crappy little shack that was falling apart. Probably might have actually had termites. I, I'm not even sure. I mean, it was just run down. It was just a little shack that they were put in. And, and that's where they stuck all the Warner Brother uh, directors and animators to yeah. make all the stuff that 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 is magic now. Yeah. And uh, from what I understand, they used to actually tour celebrities around the studio, and initially they would bring them into the Termite Terrace building, and after a few after a few bad episodes where the animators would completely punk uh, the visiting celebrity, they just avoided visiting yeah, that house altogether. Because I've heard that, I've heard that story too. Yeah. It sounded, I, it, honestly, it sounds like the stuff that, uh, that jackass guys would do, like the yeah. John Knoxville crew. Well, they're trying to have fun. I mean, to the point where like some, in the case of someone like Tex Avery, he was working, I don't think he was at Warner Brothers at that point, but he, when he was directing, I think at Walter Lance or one of the other studios there, you know, people would play games and they would like flick tacks into the ceiling or flick paper clips. And one day someone was flicking a tack or a paper clip. To I, think see I think it was a like pencil. A... I think I know what story you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, and then he flicked yeah. it and went right in a right blinded, in eye, yeah. blinded Tex Avery. So Tex Avery had one eye. <laughs> yeah, one eye. Yeah, I think, I think what's neat though is that uh, that sort of, I don't know what you want to call it, like sort of juvenile fun, uh, yeah. boys club, silly behavior. That, that sort of, I think, translated obviously into, into the work because that's the, those were some of the funniest yeah. cartoons even today. Where like, yeah. It, it must have been a, probably a, not a comfortable environment, but probably a place where at least everybody could take a, a joke, right? Yeah. Like, and you were saying before about the comparison between how like Disney cartoons were relatively kind of tame and boring. Right. And like you look at a Tex Avery cartoon or a Warner Brothers cartoon. Right. And they're funny and hilarious. I, I, I was actually talking about it with a friend the other day because we were describing Disney cartoons. And I said, I called it quaint satisfaction. Because <laughs> I remember as a kid... Never laughing. Wasn't that lovely? Because as a kid, I had, Look at all, that walk I had all the Disney cartoons on tape. Mm -hmm. Warner Brothers cartoons, they weren't really on video, but they were on television a lot, so you'd watch them on TV. But I remember watching Disney cartoons, and I never remember never laughing at any of them. I might laugh at maybe a funny drawing or something. Right. But I never would like, I would watch it like a Silly Symphony or a Mickey cartoon and be like, oh, that was nice. Right, right, right. I'm satisfied. Right. I, I watch something and I and it was whimsical and nice and I move on with my life. And I mean, back it. then it was it was still magic. People still couldn't yeah. wrap their head or, heads around probably what they were looking. Well, at, Well, at right? the time, yeah, but yeah. like even in the in the early '90s when I was just a kid, I remember watching the cartoons and I wouldn't laugh. Right. I'd be, I would enjoy it. Love. But I, I think for it. a guy like you, it's probably speaking to the fact that you that visually you were attracted to what they were doing because yeah. your style has that sort of like 
very volumetric, uh, bouncy, fun, appealing design. You know, that, that's sort of Disney's yeah. touch. I, I mean, I definitely am more, probably I would say, more inspired by Disney in terms of my animation. Right. Definitely more inspired by Disney than I would say Warner Brothers or other things. But now that I'm getting older and I go to, you know, I went to art school and I met other people who had different influences and they would show me stuff that I never saw before. And now that's starting to creep into my work. Interesting. Comics work is starting to, like European comic work is starting to kind of appear in my drawings. Even when I do storyboards, uh -huh. I'll put little things in it or I'll draw the characters certain ways. But do you think like is Japanese influence coming in? A little bit. More of the cartoony. Like I loved, what was it? What came out last year? Little Witch Academia. Oh, that was where, great. Yeah. Because yeah. there's yeah. a lot of Western influence yeah. in that. Yeah. Yeah. And like Yo-Yo Shinari and that, that, that type of animation is so like, I love playing with, because I'm so used to Disney space where everything's so nice and fluid and everything's flowing. But I like the idea of popping to poses and holding it and like, you're, but you're still maintaining screen direction and stuff. Right. Like that to me, I find incredibly invigorating and interesting watching that rather than watching like some Richard Williams. Everything's animated on ones and super right. technically beautiful. And I, like, there's no contrast. There's right. nothing. There's nothing to, to really that really yeah. pops out. Also, like certain visually. things. Certain things. Now I look at it and I'm like, well, this is animated all on ones. Right. Why? Why would you do because that? Because it's hard. <laughs> well, that's that's, that's sort of like the, that's like you watch a Richard Williams like Roger Rabbit. That is I, a type of animator though. There is a type of person out there that is a little uh, masochistic and likes that sort of. I bled over this, and that is is reason enough for it to have attention. Yeah. Whereas I think maybe a little more seasoned or wiser animator goes, I want to make an actual impact, and what's the most effective way of doing that? Right. Uh, and a lot of times, yeah. I mean, I don't know if you've seen uh, the show Gumball, but uh, I saw. Oh yeah. It's a really fun show. Yeah. I, I wish I've seen more of it because the thing I like about it is that you're, it's something I've never really seen done before. Just the mix, yeah. the mix of mixed media. I and think playing I think, with the expressions and the designs and everything. No, they, exactly. They, they're very deliberate with what they pour their their uh, their work. Like in terms of how they burn their calories, they're very specific. Yeah. And they do the same thing that you were talking about, like Little Witch Academia, where they'll have two different poses, but they'll snap from one to the next, and they'll just put enough cushioning frames to where your brain doesn't think it's too jarring. Yeah. But it still has that sort of uh, uh, yeah that sort of padding that makes it feel. Uh, nice visually. Yeah. So versus, yeah, like you said, a Richard Williams like like kind of like that whole ball, thing. Like it's like ballet. It's graceful. Right. It's just swimmy and beautiful, but yeah. it's it's maybe not as interesting. Yeah. Like I yeah. drank the Disney Kool Aid for fifteen years through my childhood up through high school into college. Like I drank the Disney Kool Aid. Yeah. Like the nine old men were these magical. <laughs> first, I first of all, nowadays I don't believe in right. idolizing anyone because uh -huh. I feel like people are human and you can look at this someone's that's work, the but best I, way you, don't, you do not put them on a pedestal at all. But now that's like, that's like when I when I met John Kay and and then yeah I learned that lesson. That's never that's early not even on. A, something you could brag about anymore. Right. 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 So yeah, so um, uh, nine old men. You put it, used to put them on a pedestal. Like and... yeah, like I, I was raised on. The, I was I drank the Disney Kool Aid. Where like these amazing. And also the Disney gave me this false like because I when I watched Disney movies and then there was that that moment where that spark of like this can be a job. I can do this for a living. And then I start studying up of like what it takes to be like one of these guys. Uh -huh. And I was looking at how to become an animator in the sense of this was the 1930s and 40s where people are getting jobs then. This is 1996, 5, 96. The world has completely changed since then. Sure. And I was completely blind to the fact that, oh, a lot has happened in the last 60 years. Right. The world is different. Society is different. People, like, the way reading, like, Disney history books and, and like, animation books and how people described it, it's like, oh, you'll, you'll work really hard. You make a really great film or have a really good portfolio. You get hired at a studio. And then you'll be there your entire career. And right. you'll make wonderful, beloved animated, character, animated films. And then you'll retire at like 60. And you will uh, oh, write, write a really great, of work really great then, book. Right. And you'll be considered a god. And then you'll die with accolades and awards sure, and all these footnotes sure. and books. And like... Well, that is the Disney uh, culture, at least the way they used to treat animators, because... Well, no, I, not exactly, because th there was a very small group of guys who were put on a pedestal. That's what I mean. Meanwhile, those, those nine old men, right? Yeah, those nine old yeah. men, but the only reason they were called the nine old men, and or it was a colloquial term, but it, the only reason that they were put on a pedestal was Wal Walt called them out by name, right. one. Two, they didn't leave during the strike of 19... The big strike in 1941, right. where all the... There was, a, you know, the whole la union labor dispute. They were loyal to Walt, and... Like they were, you know, they were good draftsmen. They were good animators. But they were, but they, they, 
and this sounds very demeaning, but they sucked up the wall. They mm -hmm. were very close to Walt. They always were like, yes, yes, sir, yes, sir. Uh -huh. And there were people who, once they were labeled the Nine Old Men, they made a ceiling that no animator could ever pass. Right, there has right, never right, been right. a story where like, oh, here's this really great animator who's been working just as long as the Nine Old Men, and he's really good. In fact, he's probably better than some of them. He's so good. Right. But either he, did he... Did he walk during the strike? He did. Oh well, who cares about him? Or like now he's a, he's almost a, he could be a supervisor, but no, the nine old men are already here, and you can't break that ceiling. See, I because feel, they set that bar. I, I feel that 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 precedent that Disney set for those nine old men is sort of uh, it sort of made the animators into rock stars in in the in the company, right? Uh, and I remember uh, when when I was at DreamWorks, it, there wasn't ever a special group of people. It was like, oh, what are you? What department are you in? You're you're in layout, great. Oh, you're in pre-visualization, great. You're a storyboarder. You're an animator, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But the first time that I visited the Pixar campus, I felt that sort of uh, differentiation with the animators, and I thought this almost harkens back to what Disney established back in the day, yeah, well, where yeah. I, I could I could freely roam around certain places, but the animation department. I had to be escorted with somebody, and I, and and uh, it was it felt like a, a holy of holies, like a sacred ground area. Like it was a VIP area. Yeah, personally. it was it was very different, and you know, power to them. That, that was back in their heyday when they were they couldn't make a bad movie. Um, but I did notice that was a stark difference between the DreamWorks campus and the Pixar campus, and I I, I can't help but wonder if that was inherited from. The, the Disney days, or who knows? Well, I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be surprised if someone like John Lasseter really, I mean, he loved the old Disney stuff. Yeah, and he and was so, a like, huge Disney aficionado. Like, yeah, he loved that whole To the thing. point where he could kind of almost throw people under the bus for not being Disney-like. Right. Like, he would say, like, this isn't Disney, or this isn't quite what we're going for. This doesn't have enough heart. Ah! Yeah. As he, as like, he hits them. Yeah, you know. or like, what, what is this, American Dog? This is very, very quirky. Yeah, right, Too right. quirky for its own good. Which looked, which looked amazing. We, yeah. It's funny, Joe and I actually ended up we did talk about American Dog and the potential of that film, and yeah, and then yeah, it just wasn't right. it wasn't what I guess Lasseter thought a Disney film should be, and that was yeah. enough for him to be like, nope. But sorry. I mean, also, but also, I mean, there's a lot of factors involved. It's not just so much John Lasseter looking at it and being like, well, this this isn't Disney enough, or this is not whatever enough. It's, I mean, Disney is not really known for unlike. Somewhere like DreamWorks, where you look at it, you can look at a movie like a, there's, DreamWorks has different style of movies. Different directors have different visual and pacing styles and different everything. Like you get a movie that's very Nico Marley, like stylized, like say something like How to Train Your Dragon or Kung Fu Panda. But then you get shows that are very Craig Kelman designed, right. like Mad like Madagascar. Right, right. But like and like that, Pixar ha Pixar and Disney have a a specific look. A, a brand, mm -hmm. a type of movie they have to make, and they have to fit that criteria. Mm -hmm. Like, I don't, I can't see an Alex the Lion right. character interacting with Shrek or interacting with Poe. Right, They're right. completely separate universes. Whereas in a Disney movie, whether it's, you know, you could take one of the Seven Dwarves and drop him into any one of those uh, short form Disney cartoons we were just talking about. Yeah, like yeah. they would kind of, but also like in the sense that there is no strong. Like art, identity, one identity. Right. Like when you look at something like Lilo and Stitch, and you're like, "Oh, that is Chris Sanders." Right, right. I mean, it's a Disney movie. And someone made a good point. There was a there was an interview that came out recently with um, John Sanford and, and Will Finn, who did Home on the Range. If you make a successful, they said in this, if you make a successful Disney movie, it's a Disney movie. It exists in the part the, the pantheon of Disney, and you can't say like. Oh, it exists as a Disney film, and here's a little entity that is magically made by this company. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you make a bad movie. The director's name is the first thing that pops up, oh, like like in the case of John Carter of Mars. Right, like that was a Disney movie, but then when it comes out in tanks, it's like, oh no, 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 Andrew Stanton made that movie. <laughs> that's not that's not us. Well, what do you what do you find more interesting? Do you do you like the idea of of sort of this consistency, or does it is it more interesting to you to see individual creators thumb thumbprint showing? Oh, the latter, up? obviously, the latter. Okay, like yeah, for me, yeah. that's what I like about watching the old Disney movies is that. And this is might be just for me analyzing too much animation over the last twenty years. Yeah, is that I like watching, and it's more evident in say like Warner Brothers and other companies because certain animator styles are more obvious. Obvious because yeah. the stuff is put through kind of a sausage machine at Disney. Right. But you could still look at a Disney film and say like, oh, so and so animated the scene because he has a very specific type of way of animating mm -hmm. or drawing this character mm -hmm. that you could see that they're acting chops in their way come through the performance is coming through of that particular animator. 
and I like that vibe, and I like, but I now... Is there, is there an animator that, that uh, you gravitate towards to, or at least that you used to as a source of inspiration? Well, I mean, there's a few now, but like at Disney, definitely like people like Ward Kimball, who mm-hmm. is the cartoony guy. Like, right. And I know other people have said this too, like Ward Kimball was the guy who did like, he did like, like the Three Caballeros, the big number where, every, where all the characters are running off screen. He did a lot it's, of the Zany stuff. It's interesting stuff. that he, he started off cartoony and he ended up incredibly stylized later in well, his yeah, career. Well, yeah, because he wanted to do something different. But right. if, if Ward was at any other company besides Disney, he probably would have been forgotten because his stuff stood out in comparison to all the other stuff that everybody else was doing. Uh-huh. He's doing the cartoony stuff, like, like almost Warner Brothers style stuff or Tex Avery style stuff in Disney. Of course, if you see, it's someone called, I think it was, I don't know who said it, but there's a, the, the term, the untied shoe theory. If you go to a shoe store and you see a whole wall of shoes and you see the one shoe where it's untied or the, 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 the tongue of the shoe is hanging open or if it's askew, sure. your eye goes immediately to that thing. Right. In the sea of Disney animators where everyone's drawing very realistically and beautifully and very nicely rendered and all this stuff and it's, it fits that style and you see the one thing that's sticking out, in this case, right. Ward Kimball, right. your eye is immediately going to go to that. But if he was amongst other like say Warner Brothers animators mm-hmm. or Tex Avery style animators, right, right. he probably would have just been lost in the shelf and would have been just guys. like another one of the animators there. Right. He stood out amongst that crowd of people. He was a weed amongst the flower bed. I got the impression that Disney also made it a point to treat him specially. Like, apparently he was the only from the nine old men that he called a genius. Yeah. Um, that he used that specific d- yeah, word and he, with. I don't know if Walt just said that off the cuff. Flippantly. And then they, yeah. And then, I mean, Walt punished him later. Like, Literally, the whole, it, 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 I don't know the whole, like the actual full like story of it, but what happened was he was animating and then Walt believed in him to the point where, all right, we're going to let you direct some space shows and some stuff for our TV show to promote our show. And he did a bunch of these man, up to man and, or Mars and Beyond and Man and the Moon. And he did these space shows for the Disneyland show for TV. And... Then he was going on and directing sh- sh- other stuff, shorts, like Two Whistle, Plunk and Boom, very designy stuff, and he was letting him do it. And then something happened where, I guess he was directing the movie Babes in Toyland in okay. the early 60s. Okay. And then someone like said, oh, Ward Kimball is directing Babes in Toyland, and it wasn't Ward's fault. But also Ward was known for pressing his buttons, too. So Walt kind of put him in his place by throwing him back into the animator pool. And he was animating on, like, oh, Ludwig man. von Drake shorts, which he hated. Because he didn't, at that point, you don't, he didn't yeah. want to animate anymore. He did everything he wanted to do in animation. Right, right. And he, did it, he was still really good at it. But going back, if you're, if you're directing and then you're throwing back and drawing, you know, commercials for peanut butter with Disney characters... They don't like what we're talking about. L.A. Yeah, L.A. It's the Disney, oh, Hollywood it's the Disney police. Yeah. Gonna come you're talking about us in the negative light? Come in with the Dude, I wouldn't Gestapo put a, I wouldn't with Mickey put a Mouse ears on him. At this point. Um, yeah, no, it's, it's interesting. Uh, Disney uh, felt like he had sort of that iron fist rule uh, in terms of uh, he intimidated a lot of people, but at the same time he had this persona that he put out there, put out there that he was sort of this... Uh, this, this like kind yeah. old uncle. Well, you know, the, the problem is that, that people make, either make Walt, someone like Walt Disney, they either make him out to be like this, this, this messiah uh-huh. of a person. Uh-huh. They either make him out to be this amazing genius, this god, this idol who could have never done wrong. Right. They make him, or they make him out to be a complete dragon, like just a really awful man. Right. anti And he was just a person. I'm sure he, he was, was a, he was a little was, bit of both. He was a yeah. dude. Yeah. He had faults. He, and the fact, like, like say, like, and he, man, and he couldn't draw Mickey Mouse, even though people he asked couldn't him draw. To. People would think, oh, can you draw? Like his, even his signature is fabricated. Uh huh. There was a guy named Hank Porter who did a lot of the war insignias in the forties. He designed Walt's signature that, like, that whenever you see the Disney D, yeah, which to me always looked like a G. I thought so too. <laughs> yeah. I think we're one of the millions of kids who looked at the Disney logo and saw that D and thought it was like an I didn't, odd G. To me, it looked like the Superman logo when I was a kid. I never saw the S. I just saw all the negative shapes, and I thought, yeah. I guess that means Superman. Right. And the same thing with his, yeah, the way they wrote his. Yeah, and then uh, there's that moment where your childhood die when you realize it is a D, right. and then the world is completely different. <laughs> right. And it's he, like the theory. And grow up. It's like the theory where like people are like, don't you remember when tricks was shaped like? Trick cereal was shaped like a, uh, like little fruits. The like, actual oh, wait. fruits. And then, like someone made this joke already, I think online, but they said, "Well, it still is. The problem is, is that you're no longer a kid. <laughs> it's, Tricks it's are for like kids. That, it's that scene from Hook. 
yeah. where you no longer what, see the food exactly. flying around. So like now you're at the point where it's like, oh no, 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 all the things you loved as a kid are still there. It's just that you're so old. Uh -huh. It's like in what Polar Express, if you don't believe in Santa Claus anymore, you can't hear the jingling of his jingle bells. Right, right. Like that was a thing if you don't believe. And then once the kid's like, I believe, I believe. <laughs> ding -a -ling -a -ling. I do believe. Like it's like the, it's the, yeah. So, but I just went on a whole tangent there and I completely forgot where I was at. Oh, we were talking about how Disney, the public expected him to be able to walk up and draw a picture of Mickey Mouse on their notebook and, yeah. and do this iconic Disney signature, yeah. but he just, he didn't actually yeah. know how to do and that Walt stuff. And would admit, like in interviews, he would say like, I never felt as an artist that was a good one. Mm -hmm. He, I, I think Walt's best, really his best talent. He was a, he... He recognized good ideas. Right. He, he was sort of a curator of really good ideas and knowing how to sort of that, that, that perfect mix of he ingredients. Knew, he knew what the average like American audience would want to see. Mm -hmm. Because you know he was like just a, a regular like farm boy right. from Kansas, but or Missouri, and he, um, you know, he had a very you know he he had a vision of what like you know average America would like, and he had a very good, he knew what people might want, and but the best thing about him I thought I feel like it probably his best trait was that he was just a really good magnet for bringing creative people in and working together. Mm -hmm. Like he built partially just through his own tenacity or through his own gumption, and people looked at that. He built a little studio, which made something that turned out being really cool or like really people liked it, like say Oswald and Mickey Mouse. Right. And then more people would be like, well, Disney's doing, this Disney guy is doing some really interesting stuff. Let's go, he's making some stuff that no one else is doing before. They're trying to make sound cartoons and cartoons with color and cartoons that are very technically beautiful. If you want to go work in animation or work in art, you should go work for Disney. Right. So then he built this thing of this, this hype of we're doing something that no one else is doing before and we're, you know, you can either work and be like a Publix worker working and painting murals, or you could go, if you're not even an animator, you can go work at Disney and be doing background paintings. Right. Or you could be doing, you know, falling in the in-between pool and doing in-betweens. But he knew how to like, if he found out that people didn't like each other, like if it's like this, is, this guy hates this guy, he would be like, oh, I'm putting these two together. Because <laughs> he knew that somehow that friction and that rivalry will, make, will create something, like a catalyst. Sometimes like a, it's like that a, competition or that sort of, I'm yeah. going to outperform you, that, that brings out sometimes yeah. the best in people. Um, I, I heard that uh, Disney, because you mentioned Oswald the Rabbit, that that actually was a property that he developed. And I don't remember the details, but it was taken away from him in terms of ownership. And that sort of put the fire in his belly to be like, fine, you can have Oswald. I'm going to make something even better and and it's going to be fine because the one thing that I'm going to do that you can't do is make sure that we have quality. So to me I uh, you know I, I always thought that was pretty admirable that he always made sure that uh, that that he was making something worth looking at that it wasn't yeah. just this it wasn't just sell the idea sell the idea it was like no the the artistry matters the craftsmanship matters the, the aesthetics matter. Yeah. And that, that is, again, that's a rare thing to see in a producer type. And that, that's something that I always thought was, was great about him, is yeah. that sort of, he, his value system was better yeah. than most. Not to mention he was also really stubborn. So like you would get, if someone, if you're making something and you're, you're the guy who makes this thing, and then the company's like, oh, well, we own your character. We actually own this character of yours. So we hired away all your artists. You have no power, goodbye. Right, and we took your thing away, and you could go back to Los Angeles with your tail between your legs mm -hmm. and go on with your life because we own the thing that you created, but it's not yours. So then he, it's pretty much vowing. It's like imagine being working for a really bad freelance client, and that person owns the thing that you did, right. and they you, they're putting you through the ringer, and you've almost vowed you never want to work. For, that's what, that's kind of like what happened to me. Like sure. I never want to work freelance again. Sure, and now, I, but in this case. I'm not my own boss. Right. There's some people who are just fed up. He want, Walt wanted to be his own boss. And, right. and he realized, he knew that from then on, he wanted to own everything he did. He wanted to have a stamp on it. Whenever you see a Disney cartoon, it would say Walt Disney presents in big letters. So people knew who the hell made that cartoon. He, he, and now he owns Star Wars. Well, not, not obviously he's not alive, I mean, but uh, yeah. he's built that empire now. That well, yes, yeah, uh, you know, it's appropriate with Star Wars that he built essentially sure, an empire. Sure. He pretty much <laughs> has the entire male demographic in his back pocket. Right, right, or, right. Not he does, but the company itself. And Marvel does. as well. Well, yeah, yeah they own Marvel, yeah. they own Star Wars, they own, you know, and they, they, they pretty much own, they've cornered a market. So I wonder speak. what he would think about uh, that, it's even more specifically the way Disney does uh, movies now where, where it seems they're, they rehash a lot of stuff, they make a lot of sequels because I know Walt was very much against the idea of a sequel. He never he, liked sequels. Yeah. But mm, I mean the thing is I don't think Walt, Walt liked making money 
because he can use that money to experiment and do cool things. Right. He liked, like he would have embraced. Like he Fantasia. He, yeah. He right. would have loved computer animation. He probably would have loved the hell out of it. Mm -hmm. He loved things like animatronics at Disneyland. He, he would, he would the, the, the virtual reality, he would think that was the most amazing thing. He'd be like, we're going to make a film in virtual reality. And right. everyone would be like, Walt, you're crazy. And he's right. like, well, I, whatever, I'm going to make it. And then his brother would have to be like, all right, what is, how much is it going to cost? i got to deal with the bankers. Oh, my God. This is the, every, everything, everything he ever did. Sn uh, making s cartoons with sound. They were like, you're out of your mind. No, I, this is something I want to do. He did it. It was successful. He did it with color. He did it with the full-length feature film with Snow White. He did it with Fantasia. In some cases, it didn't work. It, it's it, almost, he didn't make it's money. It's almost as if, if Walt... He was unstoppable only because he, like you said, he was so stubborn to make sure that whatever it is he was doing, even if it was the vir a virtual reality film or stop motion film, he, if anything, understood when something was uh, of a certain quality. And that, yeah. I feel, again, I feel like that's his one sort of uh, winning characteristic yeah. is that he always made sure it was of substance. Yeah. And, and so that, and you take that trait and you translate it over any medium and you're going to have something that's worth your time or yeah. worth at least looking at. You and know, in the case of say something like, like Disneyland was a gamble, but he believed in that gamble uh -huh. and it worked out, but he knew how to like say something like television. When television first came out, he was like, well, I don't want to get into television. Why? It's like, well, I don't understand it. Mm -hmm. if you, which is, I think is a good, it's a good stance to be on. If you're going to be investing in something, right. you want to understand what the thing is before you invest your time, energy and money into something. He didn't, understand what the possibilities were of television. But when he started thinking of ideas for Disneyland, he's like, oh, I can use television as a promotion to help promote right. this thing. So he built, essentially built a TV empire based and a whole different market and a marketing of people. scheme so for So specifically to market the <laughs> Disney name and this Disney theme park so he would get sponsors that would, the money from this, he would get from sponsors for making these shows for TV would go back into the studio or back into the theme park. So he figured out how to make, not a perpetual, not, it, would, it definitely wasn't a perpetual motion machine, but he definitely figured out how to utilize things to the benefit of like, what are the possibilities I can use this with? Right. So like he, when he figured out things like when his Imagineers or whatever, when he was figuring out how to do like stuff for rides, he would think like, oh wow, like these animatronics, like we can use hydro, like people are making these hydraulic robots essentially. That could, that could, util we can use that in the park. We can we skin can, that with a, with a bear. We can make him sing a song. We can make it a pirate. Yeah. Um, oh, I was going to say about Disneyland. Um, so, you know, I've been to Disneyland, I would say maybe, maybe four or five times. And every time I go, it's with a big group of people. And it's that sort of experience that I think a lot of people have where it goes, we, get, we gotta get to Space Mountain, we gotta get to the Indiana Jones ride, we have to get uh, this, this, and this out of the way. It's almost like a checklist to, to go through. I have the exact opposite. See, and that's, the, that's, that's where, where I'm going is, I went once, it was me and one other person, and we had been there before, so we decided to stop and smell the roses, and going back to uh, uh, you know the point of Disney making sure stuff is, is thorough, holy moly, that is such a... The, the the level of detail that they put into everything you know the the architecture the 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 textures that they that they put woven into yeah. the into the wood it's insane the the amount of artistry i guess is what i'm trying to say yeah. at disneyland it's inc it's incredible the subliminal messaging helps too subliminal messaging mm -hmm. well like in the case of say like you go to the park and you're like they have little pumps under rocks and in trees that pump certain smells in certain areas what? so like you'll go and be like did i just what get is that? What is that? I, popcorn? It smells really good. <laughs> hey, there's a popcorn stand no like 50 way. feet away. Are you serious? So That's... they will literally pump smells like cinnamon. And you're like, wow, that is a really, that smells amazing. It smells like <laughs> cinnamon? I'm just imagining that they're, that they're playing a uh, buy Frozen on Blu-ray DVD yeah. backwards. Uh, buy, you know, and, yes. Like, <laughs> like, <laughs> and then you hear like, mm. Buy ah, toys? I don't want to get a uh, cars. Yeah, <laughs> I really do want to buy one of those sixteen dollar Lightning McQueen popcorn buckets. <laughs> I really do. But uh, the thing I like about Disneyland, and it's I always call it, I call it the grandpa shit. <laughs> like the shit that no one except your grandpa wants to do. Sure, I enjoy that. Like so, like shit your grandpa does. Here's here's a good example. Here's a, a prime example of something I. It will explain me as a whole okay. just by this. Sure. So I had a bunch, it was last year, it was Good Friday last year, it was coming up to Good Friday. And a bunch of my friends were like, we're going to Disney, a friend of ours is in town, he's never been to Disneyland, we want to go to Disneyland, Good Friday, everyone's off work, we want to go. Do you want to go to Disneyland with us? And I said, well, I have an annual pass, I can go anytime, but 
And I'm like, good Friday, it's probably gonna be crowded, but whatever, I like Disneyland, I'll go. So I get there and I said, and I, I talked to him, what time should we be there by? And they said, well, be there, we wanna get there by around opening, so get there like eight and we'll meet you at the gate and we'll go inside and start our day. So I'm like, okay, cool. So the next day I drive from Burbank, the 40 minutes or whatever to get down to Anaheim. I park my car, I get out, I take the tram, go to the front, get in line, get my ticket or go through the gate and I'm inside on Main Street and I text them like, hey, I'm here, where are you guys? And they're like, oh, well, you know, our friend rented a car and he had to return it and it's gonna take a while to get down there, the traffic. So at this rate, we're probably not gonna get there for not, about, I'm gonna say about 11.30, 12 o'clock. Yeah. It's eight o'clock, the park just opened. Yeah. I'm alone <laughs> by myself. And usually I go with friends and stuff and I'm like, you gotta be kidding me, the, the, the lack of planning, and I hate that. Like going sure. with a group of people who haven't thought something through. Sure. Gives me the agita. So I'm literally in, 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 in Main Street, like, what the hell am I going to do? <laughs> and then I went, wait a minute. I, I have... You street. I, no. <laughs> <laughs> Woo! <laughs> naked as... A, I, 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 I Disney bounded <laughs> as any naked Disney character. Sure, you were a centaur from, from oh, Fantasia. I, I always said, I want to go Disney... If people, because you know what Disney bound is? Where mm -hmm. people dress up, like they dress... Like you can't wear a costume in the park because people are going to think you're a character, but you can dress like color-coded. Oh, interesting. So people will put on like, ooh, we want to be like Tweedledee and Tweedledum. If we're twins, we won't wear like a Tweedledum hat. Well, they actually stop you at the gate. No, if, if you're, if no, you're, if you're wearing over, a costume. Over costume. If, if, you're, if you're like under the age of 12, like a little girl can wear like a little princess costume because no one's going to confuse a girl that's this tall to be... a. a Right, 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 or something. Right, right. But if you're an adult, you're not going to be wearing a giant, like essentially a furry suit of, of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> sure. Because people are going to come up to you and think you're Winnie the Pooh, which they don't want you to do. Right. But you, you can color date. code yourself. Yeah. And you could be like, oh, like I like if you're twins and you want to go as Tweedledum and Tweedledee, you just wear stuff that's color coded to those characters. So you look at them, you're like, oh, that's Tweedledum and Tweedledee. Right, right. Or there's the three caballeros and there's someone who's wearing Donald's colors and Panchito's colors and whatever. Mm -hmm. And I want to go as Bernard from the Rescuers, the little mouse. Sure. Which, if you remember his design, I would wear a red hat, a red sweater, and just be naked from the waist down. <laughs> and I'll be like, there we go. That's, it, that's you Disney know what? Bound. I'm paying patronage. You, you, you can't be hey, mad I at pay, me. I paid, my, I paid my money. I got into the park. <laughs> but, I went, but I went into the park, and, I was with, and I'm waiting for my friends. I'm like, oh, what am I going to do? And I said, oh, my God, I'm alone. But usually when I go with friends, you always ask them, well, what do you want to do first? Or, oh, we want to do this first. Or, oh, we want to do that. But I actually got to decide what I wanted to do first. Yeah. And there was stuff I, I, I never get to do because I'm with people and they're like, oh, that's boring. Yeah. No one wants to go do that. And Let's... that's when you start to appreciate the magic, right? right? Yeah. So I'm literally sitting there and I, 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 I went to, front, I love Frontierland. It's like my, one of my favorite places in the park. I love the shooting gallery, which is such a boring, like, eh, no one wants to do that. But it's fun. You get put in a quarter and you, you shoot it like spit, like with a laser gun, you shoot cacti or something or a right. tin can. It goes toing. And right. I love riding the train. Right. I like riding the train, just looking at stuff. I like sitting on a bench and like looking at the ducks in the pond. Again, that was a, that was a, sorry. The train was a Ward Kimball edition, right? Like yeah. Well, was, they put his name on it, but he right. he because he was into he was super into trains. Yeah. Right. He was super into trains, and another guy, Ali Johnson, who was another one of the nine old men, were really into trains. They liked building model trains. They had Ward himself had his own model railroad. He built his own. He bought a train, like a like a like a Hawaiian sugarcane train, and he or something that for a sugar plantation. And he bought the train, the locomotive, and restored it. And That's he cool. had it running in his yard. Yeah. And Ward, uh, Walt would come over and be like, "This is really cool." And then Walt was like, "Let me take a train. Maybe we could do like a train tour of Disney right, of the right. Disney Studio." But then it grew into being like he wanted to have a Mickey Mouse park that was right next to the Disney studio so people can get like a tour and then go to the park and spend money and then the money would... But then it grew into Disneyland. Sure. I remember but, being in line to meet, uh, I think it was just Minnie Mouse. It wasn't even Mickey Mouse. And that thing took, goodness, it was, it was like like an hour, hour and a half or something. And the most you got was a quick little I, photo and then it's like, pa, next person. Yeah, you know? and you don't feel as special. <laughs> yeah, like, I thought, yeah, there's a person wearing a costume. Yeah, but going, to, but going to Disneyland and doing like the stuff that no one else wants to do. Yeah. It, I felt it was the most fun time I've ever yeah. had at Disney. Like stuff that's so like mundane if you look at it in the grand scheme of all the things right. you could do at a theme park. But I like doing and just taking in the park. Old man shit. Old man grandpa shit. Yeah, I dude. like that. Yeah, dude. I enjoy that. So just to shift gears a little bit, uh, I wanted to ask you, um, in terms of philosophy with animation, because a lot of animators have a different approach and a lot of different animators have uh, a set of, like a priority list of things that they think is important. For you, what, what are you going for? Like what, what's the jugular for you in terms of what you're trying to get out of an animation shot or animation? Like I just, I like flow, I like clarity, I like 
being able to look at something and know exactly what's going on just by looking at it. You can either turn the sound off or you can squint your eye and you could still know either what the character's thinking or feeling or what they're doing just by just by seeing it, mm -hmm. which is animation's a visual medium. Right. But I like the idea of being able to look at something. Like if you if you take a really good solid, like say Chuck Jones short, and you turn the volume completely off, or if you even turn the, the, the saturation completely off, between the shot composition, between the action or the expression on the character, you, you know what the motivation is for that character. Like right. I like, that's why I like a lot of silent film. I like Charlie Chaplin and I like seeing how just through a look or through a turn or through an expression or an eyebrow raise, you see You immediately see, understand. You see it the seems, wheels it seems like clarity is maybe one of the most important things to have if you're a filmmaker in general. I, I think a lot of, I've seen a lot of uh, student films or amateur films where they'll have a shot and they have two different elements that are unfolding and that's something that I learned uh, when I was learning animation is you only, you only really want to have one idea at a time when you're presenting stuff to the audience, unless it's something like tertiary that you can right. watch. If you're going to watch it again, you're going to notice it the second time. But in terms of like the main plot and the main point, you want to be very, very clear with what yeah. you're going for. And yeah. I learned this lesson the hard way. I did my thesis film in college and it was a, it was a six minute film with full animation with voices and with the colored backgrounds and all this stuff. And it was this big, huge undertaking. It became this giant thing. And I had so many ideas or things I wanted to do, but I, you know, I had a very small window of time to make this thing. And I made this big, this, it, it was like having a baby. It really, making a film or making a specific thesis sure. film is like having a baby. A lot or, of blood, or making any film is that sweat. you start with the idea of like, I wanna make something and bring something into this world. Yeah. And then you start as over time, the fun or the... The, 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 the contractions the, get more intense. Or yes. not even that so much. It, you, you're, you're spending the nine months, the production it takes. Because first it's like, I have an idea for a film. Let me just start. And you start and you're like, okay, this is going well. And then you hit hiccups. And then there's more work that needs to be. And then it doesn't really become fun. Or like the idea of the end product doesn't seem as exciting anymore. You just want to kind of get it out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and finally at the end, you're going through the worst parts, getting it done. You reach a deadline. Then when you're done, you have this thing. And you're kind of, you become proud of it again. Mm -hmm. And, but in the case of my thesis film, no, like it was just, <laughs> it was just like the idea, the, the initial spark was there and it made me want to do it, but it was just like, this is fun. This is fun. Pain, 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 done, I guess it's out. Cool. That was nice. Yeah. But I bit off way more than I could chew. Do you, looking back on it now, do you have better feelings about it or is it something that's Oh, I, still... I can't watch it. Oh, wow. It's at that I mean, level. That, I and, and that's unfortunate because I had people I had people helping me out on it and I'm uh -huh. proud of their work. I had friends do voices for it. Mm -hmm. I, I'm proud of their input. And it took me a long time to be proud of anything. This is something I've only learned just within the last couple of months. Mm -hmm. I'm finally owning up to self-confidence and being sure. proud of my own sure. work because I never was proud of my own work. That is the uh, Achilles heel for a lot of uh, animators and artists. Artists in that. general. And that, but I think it's... It's, I think it's important to find that balance because obviously you don't want to feel as though you figured it all out and pat yourself on the back because that way, in, yeah. the, in that case, you never improve. You're constantly better. growing. You're constantly, right, you're improving constantly growing. Artist. But at the same time, um, you know, would, certain people would take advantage of that type of quality. So you just have to protect yourself from yeah. that kind of thing. And yeah. But in the case of like, say, doing a film, I had these ideas and things were getting too complicated and I was overthinking about stuff and being like, oh, the shots have to be dynamic. So I got to cut the angles again and again and make the angles different, but I'm doing like five or six backgrounds for one particular area when yeah. I didn't think economically and stuff like that. And then I graduated and I'm kind of in between work and I'm at home and my, at the time my girlfriend was visiting and I had an idea for a film and I said, Ooh, I want to make this film uh, about a bird who's trying to build a nest on a pole. And she was like, yeah, if you ever finish it. And I'm oh, like, what wow. do you mean? She's like, yeah. And she was right. She was like, you always bite off way more than you could chew. Mm -hmm. You make things way too overcomplicated and you, you'll never finish it. You'll have, a, you'll have an idea that you kind of start and then it just sort of, you lose interest because you make it too big for its own good. And then it's, you, you'll lose interest and right. it'll just sit there half finished. And I'm like, part of me was like, you're right. Part of me was like, screw you because <laughs> I'm going to prove you wrong. So what I did was I had an idea and then the thing that helped me, and this is how I now think of everything I do now, I take an idea and I break it down into its barest minimum that it could be with, while still retaining the original, the initial sure. drive of what it's supposed to be. Sure. So like, it's a film about a bird that's trying to build a nest on top of a pole. What do I need 
to get that idea across that this, this thing, it's the staging. And I would do these full color backgrounds. So I'm like, you know what? Get rid of the background. It's just one layout. I don't need to keep cutting around to this thing. I just need one simple layout. Boom. There it is. The clarity. The Charlie Chaplin clarity. staging. Right. Um, I don't need color. Color and shading, it's unimportant. So I'm literally mm -hmm. just kind of black and white. And I think the only other color is red because I, I, it's, it's, it looks like a barber pole. It's striped with red. And the design, I'm used to making things very fleshed out and volumetric and designy, or not designy, but very Disney-like. Sure, sure. But let me make it simple. Let me break down a bird of what the simplest thing a bird can be. And it's essentially probably the most simplest design bird is probably what, like the NBC peacock. Right. Just the shape of a bird with the beak, and that's it. So the bird is just a very so graphic you, woodstock you, you looking bird. You focus more then on, on the... the the motion and the flow and well, the... it's easy it's easy to break something down into a very small thing and then building on top of it rather than starting with this giant idea and then having to whittle at it and then lose things and then things kind of become half right. so like I learned and then I made this film in like of only a few weeks and I'm more proud of this one minute little thing <laughs> than I did of that I spent two or three weeks on than this thesis film that I spent literally nine months of my life staying late nights and coloring well, I didn't, I had, luckily I had so many people help me out on it, but like I was losing sleep over it and I was getting anxious. It was making me anxious. So now I think about things in terms of simplicity, clarity, um, strong staging mm -hmm. and posing because I think that's important. And another thing too, and this bothers me so much when I see like, that's why I recently we were talking about it with some friends and they were saying like, what's the one piece of animation that you say is like the worst? Like, what can you, because I know like art is subjective. I know that people's tastes are different, but they're like, well, in your personal opinion, what do you think is like the worst piece of animation you've ever seen? Wow. Okay. And I said, um, I'm going to go out of my way and say the, the John K. Simpsons I was about to gag. say the John K. intro for the and they're like, huh? And they're like, we understand. <laughs> Clearly we understand why. Mm -hmm. And what bugs me, and now I'm very aware of it when I do my boards too, and when I board or when I animate, is that your eye, if you're looking at something on a big screen, and if you're sitting in the, you know, close to the front, you don't want to be doing this. Right, right. And when you have something going on over here, right, and something going on over here, exactly, it goes back. What to do what, you focus on? Goes back to what we're talking about. Yeah, right. You want to do one thing at a time. You, you have one character do clear. something. Right. So if you have two characters standing there, you have one character doing this, and he stops, and something else happens. Right. You don't have something going on over here, and then something going on over here. Right. Or something. Or if you're cutting, and I think about shot flow too. If you're looking at something on this side of the screen, and the and the shot changes, and you cut, right. Either have something be contrasting to that, so your eye is automatically going to fill in a gap here. Right. If the direction is like look this way, the you cut, and you're looking over here. That's something that uh, I don't know if you saw the, the latest Mad Max film, but that's something that they did pretty well because for as high octane as that film was, they deliberately had your eye uh, uh, purposefully on certain parts of the frame so that way they could they could cut at a million miles per hour because right. and it didn't feel like you were overwhelmed with information because it was always leading you from one thing to the next thing to the next thing, which I thought was really great. Right. I thought that I thought that aspect was the yeah. editing at least was incredible on that film. Well, Michael, thanks for being on the show. Uh, thanks for providing all your insight and information. It's clear you're very passionate about this stuff, so we always like to have folks like that on here. Thank you. Sam. And uh, yeah, and thanks for being a part of this. And we will see you guys on the next episode of Shot Talk. If you'd like to see more of Michael's work, you can find him on Twitter at a guy who draws. Also, if you're enjoying this music, you can follow me at inexpensivejew.bandcamp.com. And finally, if you've enjoyed this episode of Shot Talk and would like to see more episodes in the future, please consider contributing to the Shot Talk Patreon. You can sign up today at patreon.com slash shot talk. There are all types of rewards like receiving episodes early, access to private Discord servers, and more. Thanks for listening. Catch you next time.